and welcome to The Extra Mile. I'm Linda Boudreau. Our guest today is Jean Thibodeau. Jean is, I guess, unofficially, or maybe officially known as a historian for Acadia Parish. Is that unofficial or official, Jean? I would say it's unofficial. Okay. But, but nevertheless, he is a historian for Acadia Parish, which is um, a wonderfully interesting and rich parish. So we're going to talk to Jean about what, what the history of the parish is and kind of how he got into it. So welcome. Welcome for, thank you. to our show, and thank you so much for coming in. So how does one get to be unofficially the historian of a, of a whole parish, of Acadia Parish? How did you get that title? Um, writing books, mostly. I wrote a book on the history of Church Point and one on the history of rain. Okay. Are you from Church Point originally? I'm from Church Point. So you started with your deepest roots then right. and then I spread out a little bit. Started what I knew mostly. So what prompted you to even write a book about Church Point? Um, through a mistake, <laughs> a, a, a lack of, our, of judgment on Many my of own our part. best experiences are accidental, so to speak. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce back in 1999 uh, was wanting to do a fundraising project. They wanted to do the, the local church point, Chamber, Chamber of Commerce. They were wanting to do a calendar. They had gotten a local artist, uh, Floyd Sawyer yeah. and uh, Tony Wimberly. Are they both, to, they're both from church? Yes. And to donate some of their drawings to, for the, uh, uh, the pictures in the calendar for each month. Uh, and what they thought would be nice would be on the east the squares where the dates are to uh, put little historical tidbits in there. Like, you know, on June 1st, you put 1883, there was a fire that burnt down a cotton gin or something yeah. similar. And they wanted, you couldn't fit every date, but they wanted a lot of, so uh, I had already sort of been known as knowing a lot about Church Point history. So I was asked to supply the, uh, the little tidbits to put into the calendar. And uh, this is a volunteer I, initiative on your part. Yeah, I volunteered. Said, I'll and, do it. And I said, okay. And then I find out you have to read, you have to research, you have to look up everything printed or written about Church Point just to find these little tidbits. So shortly into the project, I realized it and I said, if I have to do this much work, <laughs> this much research, I might as well just write a book on it at the same time. Yeah, because really, a tidbit, really, many tidbits make a book, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's what it is. You had to read the story to get the little tidbit. Yeah. And, um, well, I had the story, I had the sources, I had everything else. So the result was, was uh, this, this book, book here. right here. I'm going to hold this up, and this is... The book on Church Point, and the title of it is? On the Banks of Blackman Brulee. Okay. Excellent. And you wrote this when? 1999. How did it feel to have your first book published? It was pretty good. I, I kind of enjoyed the, I mean, it's not like being a national bestseller or anything. But you know what? But it's yours. It, it it's was. It's yours. And, and it's about the town that you're from. Right. So when you were doing your research, Gene, what kind of interesting things did you find out about Church Point that maybe you didn't know before? Um, there, were, it was a, there was a certain amount of violence and uh, uh, people shooting, you know. Oh. There were a lot of murders and stuff, which, which was interesting. You know, I heard somewhere that a lot of the old folk songs where they talk about, you know, people getting killed and hung and mm -hmm. stuff like that. It, those were all, that was like the newspaper of the day. They would mm -hmm. kind of um, record the violence, that you, the, the violent acts in, in the folklore and the songs. Did you find some of that? No, I didn't find any songs where it was recorded, but the, the, the stories, the, uh, um, the older generation at the time, 10 years ago, they all knew about these uh, gunfight at the uh, election uh, oh. polling place. Uh, <laughs> so much for freedom. Where the uh, chief of police had a gunfight in a bar with a, another guy and stuff like that. You know, these stories, even if it was before their time, they knew about these deals. So the oral history, you were able to interview some of the, some of the older people and uh, get the oral history too? A number too? of them, yes. Uh, but quite a few, even as a child, I used to love to listen to my grandfather and his, my grandfather's. And their friends, they'd sit around telling stories, mostly. 
And I, uh, I always like to hear, especially the more exciting ones. With a little, a little dash to them. <laughs> so when you, when you wrote your book, I see that there, there are photographs in here too. So was it hard to get the pictures? There are quite, not, there are quite a lot of photographs, really. Not, not as hard. Um, for, for the first book, because I was known, it's a small town, right. so everyone knows everybody. So, you know, everybody's my cousin or something at <laughs> this point. So, so, you uh, ain't a Thibodeau for nothing, huh? There were a lot of Thibodeaus and Richards and Daigles and yeah. Guidrys. And outside of that, <laughs> you're married to one of those. That's right. That's about it. But uh, the, uh, the, the pictures for the Church Point book were not, were not that difficult. Okay. Um, I asked around. Uh, people were uh, very open to let me scan their picture. Well, scan, copy them in those days before I had a scanner. That's true. It's, uh, <laughs> not today. I can do a better job today. But, um, so you did your first book, and then what? You you, you weren't through, huh? No. Well, part of what you said was the the the, the thrill of, of writing a book. Um, led me want to, to do it again. So uh, one for research, Church Point didn't have any, in the first part of the, the century, they didn't have any existent um, newspapers. They had some, but there's no copies left anymore. Yeah, I guess they couldn't, it was hard, would, would be hard for them to sustain a newspaper, huh, because it's so yeah, small? In the, in the 40s, they finally did. The, oh. the, the, rain, the rain signal, basically had a Church Point section that grew into Church Point News. Okay, good. So before that point, to find anything about Church Point, I'd have to go through the rain signal um, for about 50 years. So in doing the research for the Church Point book by reading 50 years of newspapers, uh, I learned a lot about the history of rain also. And I was Oh, yeah, I have all this information, I might as well use it. So the, the, the result was the second book, which I did in 2001. And uh, on, this is book number two, and it is? Rice Railroads and Frogs. Great name for, for rain. Uh, so again, you've got a lot of photographs and a lot of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of information here. What did you learn about rain that you didn't know before? Was it as violent as Church Point? It, was rain as violent as Church Point? Yeah. Okay. Everybody was shooting. Everybody's fine. Everybody, everybody had a gun back then. <laughs> but well, what did you find out about rain? Well, the the frog business was a big uh, was to me was interesting because I wasn't familiar with it. It was uh, the frog business. Well, rain is famous as the frog capital. Right. But why is it? Because they had a shipping business from almost the start of rain's history. It went on for almost a hundred years where they bought frogs and sold them all over the United States. Wait, help me understand. They bought frogs? To eat, yes. Did, they, know, did they like catch them there or are they just bringing them in? And they, they were catching them there um, through the rice fields, mm -hmm. uh, have a lot of frogs. Right, right. And um, they would catch, the, people would catch frogs and then they would go to usually store owners or, or, and trade them. Back in the Depression, there wasn't a lot of money, so you would, you would uh, bring your frogs in, and they would give you credit for groceries. Or well, they would get some money okay. would change hands. Yeah. It all depended. Uh, the, but it was mostly local farmers and teenagers and whatever that would go out at night and catch frogs, bring them in to the different dealers who set up in rain because the, the the, the railroad, railroad was, there, was there, yes. Which is why Rain was where it's at anyway, because it's a, it's a railroad town. Was Rain developed after the railroad? I thought it was there before. There was a little town called, and I'm not sure of pronunciation. Uh, what is French name? Poupeville or okay. Poupeville. I'm okay. not sure which exactly how it is. It was named after a, uh, a store owner who had a, uh, south of where Rain is today, he had a uh, uh, store a little country store out in the middle of nowhere in the 1850s, I believe. And so a little town developed. He left, but they still called the town Poopeville. After him. After him. And the railroad passed about a mile or two 
north of this. So the few merchants in 1880, when the railroad came through, they were uh, smart enough to know that a mile away from a railroad doesn't make sense. Right. So they, they actually lifted a church even, put it up on uh, an ox, uh, put it up on wheels and had a, a huge team of oxen pull it to grain. Wow. And then the other, the other merchants and blacksmith, there was a doctor, they all moved to Rain. And, and that's how the town of Rain became. Town. What a great but story. But it was a boom, it was a boom town because it also, right. and it wouldn't lots have moved. of other people came from all over the, all over the state and all, and from outside of the state also. They would have say that little village forever had the railroad not been, exactly. you know, a mile away. The, um, the location was a good spot because later on, uh, Highway 90 was built through there, and then after that, Interstate 10. So it's always been on the on the the transportation route. On the transportation route, where Church Point is much much older. The area around Church Point was settled in the probably 1780s, but it's never it's never uh, the bayou that it's located on is not navigable. Um, the railroads Didn't missed come. it. There was a railroad for a while, but it came later and it was small, the Opelousas Gulf Railroad. So came to go through. to Church Point, you have to intend to go to Church Point, whereas to go to Rain, you could just go right on by it. Exactly. No. So they had the, you know, they had the, they were nearer to the markets. Everything before uh, trucks came about had to be offloaded in Rain and brought to Church Point until mm -hmm. 1907. So they had, a 30 year, almost a 30 year jump right. on transportation on Church Point. So that town grew where Church Point uh, has been fairly small. But has kept its, serious, I say this in all seriousness, it's kept its charm and it's a, it's a lovely, lovely town. And it's it probably because being more isolated by transportation, it retained more of a Cajun flavor. Right, it's more, it's like, to use the word authentic, it, it, it feels like, it feels like it, feels like an I, old I town. I agree, yeah. You know, it feels like an old town. It's a good feel. It is more, it's less, you know, less outsiders came in, in yeah. other words. Yeah. So, Church Point, even to this day, most people can count their, you know, five or six generations back, they're all from Church Point. Yeah, and for the rest of us, we can probably tell you how many times we've been through Church Point, because you have to go there. You have to go there. You still have a buggy basketball there? Mm -hmm. It was this weekend. <laughs> okay, that's what gets. That's what always got me there. You just, you, she just missed it. <laughs> I thought it was around this time of year. Just kind of felt that way. So the railroad had a lot to do with it, and and I guess for for rain, based on your title, rice also was a, a biggie for exactly rain. right about the time that uh, uh, the railroad came through. Um, different Germans and a few others, Germans in Roberts Cove and in. Mm -hmm near Mowater, started experimenting in rice culture. They had... Um, so rice, rice wasn't grown there? Rice, then. yeah, it was grown, but it was grown more, um, not commercially, it was grown for local use, okay. like garden type thing. Okay. If you had a low spot, you planted rice. If it was a wet year, you had rice. If it was dry, you didn't. Okay. And so, so rice was, a, rice was uh, eaten. Mm -hmm. It was, a, it was a part of the staple menu then. Yes. Okay. But for commercial, uh, for Acadia Parish, Jeff Day was all the way to Lake Charles. The, the open prairies where the rice industry grew up was, uh, it had a lot to do with sugar. At the same time, at the time the railroad was passing through, was opening up these empty prairies. Very few people lived out in the open there. At that point, uh, um, the, the tariff went up on foreign sugar, and all the rice in Louisiana was, was farmed along the Mississippi River at the time. There were lots of rice mills in, in New Orleans. Okay. I did not know that. What would, with the timing, well, it became, they could make a lot more money with sugar cane. So all of that along the Mississippi River, and it still is, turned into sugar yeah. cane land. That's what I think of it as being, yeah. So suddenly there was no rice to mill, and the rice mills in New Orleans were 
about to close because there was nothing to, there was no uh, product to mill. The, at that time, they had opened up all the open prairies. It was all open land, and there's a, a clay layer underneath the topsoil. When you start passing, mm -hmm. you get west of Lafayette. That holds water very well. So it actually was perfect rice land. You just had to find a way to irrigate. And the technology at that time was, was developing. You know, they were getting lift pumps. Along the Mississippi River, you just cut a levee right. and, and you flood Yeah, your you're field. good, yeah. But uh, in, in the, prairie, in it's the a prairies, water. you had to get water up. Right. Uh, you couldn't depend on rain to fill your rice fields. Yeah. So mostly from bayous, they, uh, pumps became readily available. They started pumping out of bayous, so land right along bayous was good rice producing. Then they started digging canals, and the canals they would pump into the canal and then open gates. They could go lots of areas. You could get away from the bayous even through these canals. And then later on, uh, deep wells, irrigation, you know, mm -hmm. which is most common today. Yeah. So the, the technology al allowed them to become rice. And to this day, it's still rice between Lake Charles yeah. and, and Lafayette. Yeah. Did they move the rice mills or did they ship the rice to? They, uh, the, for the first few years, they shipped them to New Orleans, but then um, rice mills grew up like... Makes sense. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, like crazy. You know, Crowley once had probably well over a dozen mills at one time. Wow. Uh, Rain had uh, two of them. Uh, even Church Head Point had a small one, which is a little outside of the the rice. Right, yeah. It's part of it, but it's like Lafayette. It's just a little outside of the, the rice thing. But everywhere down the railroad, uh, every town, Roanoke, Welch, Jennings, there was rice, rice mills left and right everywhere. In fact, they had built too many of them. So they had, they had to consolidate. Yeah. Eventually, they consolidated. And that's what we have today. Yeah. Isn't it just amazing, though, how, how everything just, as it falls into place, one thing leads to another, to another, and, mm -hmm. and that, then that's how our lives look. You know, it, these things are shaping our lives all the time. I mean, you, most of the, my interest is, is how the uh, economy shapes. You know, our lives. It's how you make a living. Right. Why did the people, why did the people come to these places in the first place? Yeah. What, they had to make a living. Yeah. You can't go somewhere and starve. Uh, the first, the, the, the prairies were great cattle country before the Lots Civil War. Lots of open space. They were, they were uncounted herds of cattle that were just let loose. Sort of we hear about Texas mm -hmm. roundups and stuff, but in Louisiana, that was predating the Texas. I didn't know, again, something I didn't realize. Because uh, we don't have that much cattle going on here now, do well, we? No, we fence everything in yeah. nowadays, and we have roads and cattle kind of get in the way. Yeah. You can't let cattle loose yeah. like they did 150 <laughs> then, years ago. Yeah. But that was the, the basis of the, uh, the economy the only cash crop you can have but because no roads, there were no railroads, there were no rivers that you could move crops or yeah. to sell, but you could walk a cow. You can, you can make them walk go. half at a there distance. <laughs> and then brought, because yeah. I heard in the early 1800s that uh, meat in New Orleans was cheaper than vegetables. You're kidding. Oh my gosh. Be and it was because of the immense herds of uh, cattle. And they were just the driving them. The they were just driving them down. But the Civil War happened. And at that point, it demolished the cattle industry. So that's what did it? Yep. And what was it about the Civil War that ended the well, cattle the, industry? The, the, the northern troops came in, passed through Opelousas, Lafayette yeah. area three times. Yeah. And, and the first time, they stripped it bare. They took everything. They herded the, the cattle, the horses, everything they could find. And nothing was rebuilt in that, in that direction after that. On top of that, they, uh, for firewood, and they burnt barns, they burnt uh, the corrals, the fencing, and everything else that took generations to build up. They just demolished it. And then there was an urgency to uh, 
to make a living after that. And then uh, mostly it was cotton. Yeah, yeah. And cotton became the, the big crop in this area. Uh, the prairies like Crowley, Jennings area there were still empty. There were very few people at that point. But the more populated areas along the, the smaller bayous uh, became cotton land. Lafayette was cotton. Uh, so it was around Church Point, which was... Which is more like Lafayette in terms too. of its geography and, and that kind of thing. Geology. Geology, even. yeah. The, uh, uh, so in addition to your books, which are still available, by the way, I mean, yes. you have some copies. I left. still have a few. Uh, okay. If copies. somebody wanted, because I mean, I certainly want some. I bet you other people do too. But you also, from there, you, I guess you got the writer's fever, huh? Because you write now. You write for three Acadia Parish right. newspapers. The, the, the three, right? the three largest towns in Acadia Parish, Crowley, Rain, and Church Point. Uh, the newspapers, the Crowley Post Signal, the Rain Acadian Tribune, and the Church Point News, are actually all owned by the same company. Makes it easy. It makes it easy. <laughs> yeah. So in 2003, I went to the office of uh, the editor of the Crowley uh, Post Signal with a sort of a proposition to write a monthly column, and he agreed to. But I said, but my stipulations were, I wanted it in all three newspapers, and uh, he agreed. He agreed to that. They all agreed to it. So every month since 2003, I write a history article. It has to concern some, I, I can vary on my subjects, but mostly on Acadia Parish, something about Acadia Parish because, or the, some connection. Of, because your audience is, is from Acadia Parish. It, it is, Parish. because it's the three newspapers yeah, in there. Yeah. Um, so for 10 years, nearly 10 years, I've been doing that. So. So how do you find all your sources? I mean, I, I read a lot. <laughs> is there a lot still available? A lot of a lot of literature, a lot of a lot of. Um... It, it, some of it's literature, but a lot of it's courthouse records. A lot of it's. Uh, so you just do the hard research. You you go back and really look at, at, at old times, newspapers. It, it old newspapers are, are. Old newspapers produce a lot of these articles. And um, what about what about the living history of it all? I mean, I know that. You know, each generation dies off. But are you still able to talk to some of the old people about the old stories and how things used to be? Sooner or later, we become the old people ourselves, and we can tell our own stories. But you know, yeah, we're starting to do that already. <laughs> I'm, knocks telling, on your door. I'm telling too many stories already. <laughs> That's what my kids say. <laughs> it will knock on your doors. But are, are you still able to get, you know, get that oral history too? As much, but it's not as you know. Every year. Every year we become, like you said, the yeah. older generation, and the older generation dies off. So, but yes, I'm always talking history. Um, when when I come home, I usually have two or three messages to contact people. They either want to ask me a question or want to tell me something. Or so uh, they come to you now. Is that quite right? Quite often, which is really a help because in all these years, after a while, it's you know, I mean. Um, my math, what, you've been doing this since 03, so what, nine, ten years, nine mm -hmm. years? It, it gets hard to come up with topics after a while, huh? or, or do you find that that's a pretty I, easy I run plan? into spells where I'm thinking, I'm going to have to quit because I'm running <laughs> out, and then all of a sudden, um, I, I don't know why, but inspiration hits, and wow, I think about four or five different subjects to start researching on. Because it's living. It, you know, that, history, although we think it's just, dead and gone and passed, it really isn't. It's a, it, there's a certain dynamic quality, I think, to history. And looking, I was researching in old newspapers, looking for uh, uh, a minor league baseball team, information on it. And at the same time, I read about a, a National Guard unit from Crowley that during the... <laughs> border because of the incidents with uh, Pancho Villa attacking the really? United States. <laughs> so I said, well, that's one. And then I'm reading the same news, the same series of newspapers. And uh, a sheriff in uh, St. Landry Parish was murdered while he was arresting uh, a fugitive. He, and the, he ends up die, getting shot and dying. 
And the manhunt went on for a month, and there were sightings all over in Acadia Parish, Allen Parish, Calcasieu Parish, Jeff Davis Parish, Evangeline. It, all over, there was a, a six parish manhunt for him. So I said, well, there's another, that's another good story. Did they catch their guy? Yeah. All right, good deal. And he was executed. We are. So, so the, the end of the story is that he was executed. So, Gene, I hate to tell you, but we're out of time. Oh. So I just want to thank you for coming, for sharing bits and pieces of, of, uh, of your history. And I encourage anyone who's interested in more to get in touch with Gene, get a copy of his books, and um, lots of interesting stories. Gene, thank you so okay. much for being here. Thank you. And thank you for watching The Extra.